Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this talk uh, by Gregory Heilemann. Uh, uh, Greg is the Associate Chair for Computer Engineering at uh, the University of New Mexico. He's also a professor there, and he's done a sub uh, substantial amount of work in the realm of uh, digital rights management. And um, uh, Greg has been uh, a professor, as I said, a researcher, um, entrepreneur, and uh, he had a company uh, that he founded. And um, he's he was also my uh, thesis advisor for my dissertation. So uh, welcome, Greg, and thank we you, Henry. Look forward to hear from you. All right, is this working okay? Yeah, it sounds like it. All right, so uh, again, my name is Greg Heilman. I'm at the University of New Mexico. And um, so I just wanted to give a talk where maybe if, if people wanted to, a, a lot of it's kind of uh, philosophy of how you might want to manage uh, uh, the rights of content, how people use content. So uh, I welcome feedback if you want to talk about it or if you disagree, because this is a kind of a controversial area. So I wanted to start by saying I, I, I saw that uh, about almost six years ago today, it was in, I think it was June 4th, Cory Doctorow gave a, a talk here um, from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And he, he spoke to inside this, I don't know if it was in this same room, but you can find his talk online. It's a very interesting talk. And maybe you remember it. Somebody say he started with saying, greeting fellow pirates, arg, right? So a pretty memorable opening. Anybody? He said you might have seen it. Yes. So uh, the talk summary was DRM isn't working. It's bad for society, for business, for artists, and for Microsoft. Um, <clears throat> so it sounded almost, almost like some of the campaign ads you hear around uh, election time, right? This guy's going to do all sorts of bad things to you. So uh, the author was and continues to be concerned, if you look up about the rights associated with that talk, if you go online to, and you look up the talk, I mean, he put a Creative Commons license around it uh, and, you know, so, and basically to put it in the public domain. So he was concerned about how that talk was going to be treated. So clearly, clearly that author had concerns about how people were going to use his words. So he is concerned about rights, and that's just an interesting thing uh, to note about this. Now, um, there's been this debate for a long time, and it's, uh, it's been going on for a long time about how, you know, there's two sides of DRM, right? There's two sides to this coin. Um, this is the, the classic part of the debate, and I'll talk to you uh, during the course of this talk about kind of um, where I think DRM is going to be going, right? So this is the one where I couldn't afford to buy music if, if I didn't steal it, right? And this is from, you know, and then he's got all the, the uh, skateboard and everything else. This is the industry view of things, right? Another cartoon uh, that I found that showed the industry view of things. It's about the music man sharing it, all that business. And then the band is saying, no, it's about, you know, us getting paid for our work. Creative Commons license? Uh, you know, I'm not sure about that. The question is this. Yeah. <laughs> I cut and paste, so. <laughs> fair use. How about that? We'll, we'll claim fair use on this one. Uh, if, you, it, it's, if you look at the user side of it, there's this, you know, associated with the um, EFF and others, there's this defective by design. Uh, they go to into Walmarts and on, on, on these... Um, iTunes, they put these little stickers on them, right? For real? It's for real. This is for real, yeah. They, this is a, a group that uh, really works to, to try and get these things removed, right? This is the other one that I thought was very nice. So this is iPods, iTunes plus DRM it's doing, doing this to you. Um, and in fact, May 4th, and I looked this up last night, May 4th, 2010 is the day against DRM that these... Uh, folks have put together. I don't know if you've seen a couple of years ago, they actually went into the Apple store in Manhattan in, in hazard suits and they occupied the store because, you know, because of the, the, the DRM. So, um, and they've done a few other things like that. So they, they've actually had this day against DRM for about the last five or six years. Um, it, it used to be in October, but now it's, it's May 4th this year. So make sure you celebrate it. Um, 
This, I just pulled this up just to kind of show the two sides of the, of the coin here as well, right? DRM, a set of conspiracies by companies that are formed with a specific purpose of restricting the public's use of technology. Talks about how, um, you know, basically these people should be thrown in jail. And then, uh, you know, Bill Gates, is, is, there's some modern day sort of communists who want to get rid of the incentive for musicians and movie makers. So this is kind of how that debate has been carried out. I mean, there's, there's you know, strong feelings on both sides of this. And um, here's an algorithm I wrote just to figure it out. It's pretty easy, right? To the previous slide. Yes. That uh, Richard Stallman is paid by MIT. <laughs> Well, it's actually a little more complicated than that. More complicated? Uh, he gets space, but I think he's not drawing salary. Mm -hmm. Okay. But support at least some. He gets support and has always for years um, gotten space that's been covered by the AI lab. Is it the AI? Yeah. And he, got, he's, he, comes, he gives, I think he's been at UNM three or four times since I've yeah. been there giving talks. Very, gives a good talk. And he charges for his t-shirts a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the, the point is there's, you know, it depends on which side of the fence you're sitting on, I guess, I, I how you view these things. I lived for four years in grad school. <laughs> you what? I lived next door. Oh, did you? Well, he lived in his office and I had my office. Ah, <laughs> so I, interesting. Yeah. So that was just a little, little algorithm I wrote to figure it out. I could, <laughs> got it all in, in five lines. Um, there's the whole debate. Uh, so, so. The, the problem today is DRM is a very toxic uh, acronym. In fact, you know, if Steve Jobs goes out and says, you know, he, I want to get rid of DRM, uh, I don't want it, you know, of course he doesn't want it because he wants to sell iPods. I mean, if, if there's more music, he's going to sell more iPods. So, um, but these are the types of things that are always, always going on out there. Uh, I don't want a rootkit installed. I mean, if some, something bad happens, it certainly makes the press. So yes. nobody wants it. Sony put a rootkit. Yes, uh, it was funny. I was at a DRM uh, conference la at the CCS last year at the DRM workshop, and and one of the speakers actually was able to get one of those CDs. It's hard to find them now. Yeah, so they're collectors' items. If you, I think he said he had to go and get on it on. eBay? Yeah, I think that's where he got it off eBay. Uh, if you think about it, there are, there are hardly any vendors in this space. I mean, if anybody does anything in this space, it's end to end for the most part. If somebody's doing anything in this space, it's like Apple or, or Microsoft. I mean, it's, it's an end to end solution. There's, there aren't individuals really working, doing, maybe there's... There's the, the uh, what's it, DVD? What's that company? There's a couple, uh, yeah. the, 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 the Macrovision, Macrovision, Macrovision uh, uh, Digimark, you know, there's a few, yeah, there's, there's a few. That's, but, but if you think about the ecosystem, it's not, it's not similar to, say, networking technology, where there's a company that does, you know, specializes in some, some area of, of that. Um, so that's what I just mentioned. It tends to be end-to-end. -end. Uh, you know, the, the thing is that DRM, maybe we don't call it that, but it's going to exist. I mean, because rights aren't going away. In fact, people are, people are very concerned about them. Um, and so really, really the, kind of the question is, how, how does this evolve? What form will it take? And that's kind of what we're, we've been working on for the past few years. Um, is it going to be, uh, is it going to be a usability issue that kind of breaks through this? If you look at the uh, iPod, iTunes, Fairplay setup, very successful commercially, you know, phenomenally successful. Uh, it, there's, there's always been DRM as part of that. And it's, you didn't really see it. It was um, transparent to you for the most part. I mean, people still complain about the fact that sometimes if you, uh, you know, move songs or, or you know, if you, if you go through enough machines, you run through that limit that they put on you in terms of, what is it, five, five machines or something like that. I think it remains to be seen what, what will happen when iPod is shut down. I mean, yeah. it won't be around forever. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. Probably someday Apple yeah. will decide yeah. not to do iTunes anymore. And what happens to all that music everybody plays? Well, yeah. Well, and, and so, so that's happened already in the EU. The EU is saying, if you buy this song, you've got to be able to play it on, on any platform. It's happened with older e-readers. There were previous, yeah. um, there was a Jem e-reader, right? There was, there were books you could buy for it that you just can't do anything with anymore. Yeah. 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 
And we've had it when we've shut down online activation services. Independent yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's an issue. I mean, if, if the platform just goes away, what happens? Or, I mean, I guess there's a similar <coughs> issue when uh, Amazon pulled the book back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 1984. 1984. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How ironic. Uh, <laughs> so so the, the, point here, the point is, is there a business model type of solution to this, which, which is what ends up happening to solve a lot of these types of problems. But there's also this... Uh, this other approach that it's, it's not really DRM oriented, it really is more pure business model. When Radiohead offered this um, album online and uh, before it was released any place else, they just said pay, pay us, before it was actually released as a CD, pay us what you think is fair for this. And, um, you know, I can't remember, at, I was monitoring this up to a, a certain point and people were trying to estimate how much money they made on it. It was a significant amount of money and the average amount people were paying were probably more than what they would have gotten on iTunes. It was, I can't remember, it was more than a dollar per, per uh, download for this. Do they have a DRM protection? On There's nothing, nothing. 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 But, but they have rights. I mean, they have rights associated with this. If you right. read, if you go through and sign up, uh, w when you went through to sign up to do this, I don't, you can't do this anymore, I don't believe. Um, it would specify all the rights. I mean, you weren't supposed to share this. They told you these things, and then they let you download it, and then you had the opportunity to pay them what you thought was fair. So those are kind of the, the types of things that we see, I would say, in this, this new model. I mean, these things work. They're not root kits. They're, um, they had some success. So uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to show you some examples of these Creative Commons licenses, the, the, for example, the one that was attached to that talk that was given here previously. You actually do go through this. If you read this, it says, um, you know, you, can, you keep your copyright, allow to copy, distribute your work uh, only on the conditions you specify here. Uh, now, if that's not trying to manage rights, uh, I mean, I don't know what is, but it's, it's so interesting because if you ever hear these talks, you know, by, by any of these folks, Stallman, Cory Doctorow, they all really push this. I mean, and, and so there is rights management here, but they, 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 they speak so strongly against digital rights management because they're equating digital rights management with uh, preventing your ability to, to render something. All right, so th those two have been equated now. And so that's one of the problems in this field is that the, the acronym is so toxic you, you really can't use that. It, it means something very specific. You shouldn't even call it that anymore. They, they call it digital restrictions management. The digital restrictions management is what they, what they say. But look at you go through. Are you going to allow this for commercial use? And I've seen plenty of Creative Commons licenses. You're free to use this except for commercial purposes. If so, you need to contact us. And then we'll figure out how to, how to you know, Monetize it. exactly. How, how, do, how, how do we get paid? Now, should that be digitally handled? It should, there should be a way to specify policies for doing those things. And so that's really... It, you know, if you if you go back and look at the goals of Intertrust and these other companies a long time ago, that's all they were after was to try and do that. It was the way these systems ended up being implemented were just so um, nasty that that uh, you know the, the one thing the one thing that people latched onto and they wanted to use them for is to prevent your ability to render a song or uh, you know an ebook or something like that. And so that's what they became notorious for. Um, we talked about Corbis Image uh, today. Big stock uh, photography company. If you look at Getty Images, the other one, they've got, I think, close to maybe more than 100 million images each. Uh, if you click on an image, it pulls up, uh, pulls up a very, here's one I got this morning. Uh, here's one of, from the Andy Warhol collection. A lot of restrictions on this one because it's Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, and you look at all of the, the, the rights or restrictions associated with this. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's for pay. You know, not available for use by the general re uh, retail merchandise industry, so on and so forth. If you look at a lot of these Corbis images, they have uh, advertisers use this, right? So if you need a particular image for an advertising campaign you're using, you pull it up. <coughs> excuse me. It'll tell you uh, maybe you, as an advertiser, would like to uh, make sure that your competition can't use that in wh wherever you're running this ad. Things of that nature. Um, and then Corbis likes to sell it to you based upon uh, how widely it's going to be distributed. So if it's in a, a mark, uh, if it's in a newspaper that has large um, uh, subscription, they'll they'll charge more for it. So there's, there's fairly complicated rights around these things, um, and the way you manage it, for the most part, particularly for something like this, you have to call them and work it out with them. 
have to deal with these guys. Uh, I actually went to Corbis about two years ago and met with the legal department there. And the way that they tried to determine if folks were infringing is they had a big room full of people that were looking through magazines, trying to find their images, to try and figure out if their images were being infringed upon. And then I talked to the, uh, the head attorney there, and he had this big list of the, the folks that were infringing. And he told me, um, most of them just don't know it. They've just used things because they've got a complicated set of terms here. They've exceeded those usage. To, they, they, they've exceeded you know, the time limit they were supposed to use it or how they were supposed to use it. You know, they used it in an advertising campaign and put it on a brochure, and they should have paid us a little more for that. We just need to tell them. We tell them, they'll pay us. That's all there is to it. Um, you know, I was talking to Jason earlier today about the fact that uh, I think it's estimated about 10% of corporate budgets goes to advertising. Right? And a big chunk of that goes to just purchasing these types of materials. So there's a huge industry here. And these folks aren't like music file shares. They don't, they, you know, it's not like they want to get these things and pass them around. They want to use these, product, they, they want to use these uh, materials legitimately. So if you give them a way to do it and can streamline this, they'd use it. So there's other areas in which these things, uh, rights management techniques could certainly have huge benefit if we could figure out how to specify these things and take, uh, make them machine actionable. And so that's one thing that's lacking right now in both the creative commons. They can specify everything. I mean, they want to, they want to manage rights. They just don't want to make it machine actionable because once that happens, or they really just don't want them enforced is what the issue is. They don't want it machine enforced. They want you to have to contact them. Uh, Time Magazine is another one. I went uh, on the same trip I visited Corbis, I met with folks at Time Magazine, and they, they told me, they showed me their workflow. And their workflow, it's, it's pretty uh, intense how they you know, get that, finally get that magazine out. And there's a big, uh, because they use Corbis very heavily. And part of this process is, you know, when the editor finally goes in and says, yeah, this is how it's going to go, they've got to make sure they've got all the rights to everything that's in that magazine. And they've got to go back, and it's a lot of phone calls, and they're calling, and it's, it's at least two years ago, it wasn't very streamlined on how they could do that. So this, this, th there's an obvious tie between these two where they should be able to link up, automatically negotiate over these things, figure out how, and maybe even track how they're used and charge accordingly. I mean, this is, this would make the lives of these folks a lot better. To what extent are Getty and Corpus, or AP Stock Brothers, or those guys, now putting a standard model in place? Because, I mean, that's, I mean, when you look at, like, what iTunes did, when they basically said, yeah. okay, here's what you get to charge, and here's what the rules are, yeah. you play or not. And you would think that Getty and Corpus being big enough, I mean, get, they can't do anything yeah. about the yeah. stuff they've already acquired. Yeah. Like, anything new added. Yeah, so the, the, so, I don't, I haven't seen where they've, I think they all have their own, the models are the same. I mean, there's, there's two big categories. There's, there's uh, rights protected and royalty free. And there's some stock sites that are entirely royalty free. You buy them, just do whatever you want with it. And then there's others that are rights protected. You know, may, the, the ones you mentioned, National Geographic now has their own site, a few others. Um, it, I think they all kind of form their own, have their own, um, technology for doing it, but it's all pretty similar model, I think, where you end up kind of having to call and, and talk with them. In the end, you're having to, if it's, if it's, um, if it's something beyond, you know, just some, some standard image, you, you have to call and talk to them. There's an interesting company in New York called Wire Image that provides tremendous, if you look in People magazine, a lot of the uh, celebrity photography, they, they interesting, they, this company pulled all the celebrity photographers in and then had formed a company with them. And so they formed this stock site and it does very well. People Magazine, for example, uh, had tons of credits from them. And uh, I was also talking to them about how they, they got the only photograph, I think, of Julia Roberts' wedding in Taos, New Mexico. And uh, when they put that up on their site, they wanted, you know, a lot of uh, watermarks across it, things like that, so it was, wasn't very usable, and they were selling that for, for high dollar. Um, so there's a lot of negotiation, a lot of talking about that particular image. Um, yes? One can uh, um, challenge them in courts, because Corpus broke the road whatever they wanted. One can argue whether it's reasonable or not. Did anybody ch challenge them? Challenge, you mean based on the, 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 license? the license? Yes. Um, Whether the license is 
lawful. Actually, there's not a lot. It turns out they have a lot of leeway. You, your defenses, mm -hmm. right, are fair use. And you can argue that you could that it comes down to the fact that because the image is born copyrighted, you get no rights. The guy who owns the image basically has to give you, and they can write whatever license they want. But if they, so you, let me sharpen. Suppose oh, Corby says, if you use my image, you know, uh, you, you pay me a billion dollars, something people cannot do. They, that, that's right. And then if somebody goes to court, obviously they will not collect so much. Money. Well, no. What would happen is they could be found infringing, and the court could assign alternative damages based on what they said the value actually was. So you're right, the court could decide what the value of the image was. Mm -hmm. But so but you would still be found to be infringing. And there could also be injunctions against infringement too. They could stop you from shipping stuff. And I think a lot of these um, I think a lot of the difficulties with DRM comes in when, when you get a song and you don't realize what else is attached to it. I mean these terms are up front, you've agreed to them, and so I think that legally you know, makes everything justified. I think a lot of the issues are, I, I got some from the iTunes. I don't, didn't realize that I can't use it over here or the platform dies now. You know, I should be able to, or I, sh I just should be able to, I mean, the, the idea behind all of these things is if you purchase a piece of content, you should be able to use it wherever and however you want to. I mean, I should be able to make a copy and play it on um, a tape player or something like that. That's always been... Yeah. Well, oh, but there. Oh, that's a whole separate. So there, there are restrictions of that nature. Yeah. So, the, the 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 interesting thing you brought up, Brian, though, is about you know kind of how iTunes has created this business model that's very successful. Um, similar thing happened with with Corbis and Getty is that most of the, the the freelance photographers who try and make a living producing those types of stock images, they have to use them now. And uh, they've set these similar types of terms. It's here's what you're going to get, take it or leave it. And so if you go out and kind of read these, these photographers, they're not real happy. Uh, it's really it's, it's made their life very difficult, actually, to make I, a living. I would think the example well, you showed earlier with the document, yeah. where because of the, I guess, the Warhol um, yeah. uh, genealogy of the yeah. image, has all these weird restrictions on yeah. it, right? Yeah. That doesn't help Corbis actually sell an image, right? It's yeah. in Corbis's best interest to make the terms as as clear and yeah. as automatable as possible. Yes, yes, yes. And 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 you know the, the other part is to be able to track how things were used and to be able to actually collect, you know, beyond that. And that's that's what's what's lack. Well, that's what they're doing manually at the moment. So, so in the case where you have um, like this Julia. <coughs> <clears throat> yes. Um, do you know if they negotiated separate terms and pricing? Yeah, I, I, I can't remember what ended up happening, but the way it was explained to me is, you know, for those images, it's, you know, somebody gets it first and that magazine sells, you know, you know whatever people, the people who buy those types of things, they see it, right? And it was, you know, there's Julie Roberts on the cover and they'll, they're going to sell a lot of that issue. And so I think they just start some bidding. I don't, I, I'm not sure exactly it how. It seems to me like there would be two major classes. Uh, one is the classes of uh, sort of the, it's a general case yeah. of stuff where you've got yeah. a preset policy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your, your creative, yeah. creative commons yes. license or what have you. Yeah. And you've got these special cases yeah. where you really need something custom. That, that's <laughs> the case. And I think the other thing, by the way, I don't need to repeat questions or anything. Everybody can hear okay? Uh, the, we all can, yeah. Well, they, they've got ambient mics. So they're good, yeah, okay. They um, yeah, that's the case. What's different in the stock one, too, though, is a lot of times the, purchase, the person purchasing the image will say, I'd like to purchase some, some. So there's the standard set of rights. You know, the, the royalty free is very easy. I mean, you just purchase it and use it. Um, the rights protected, there's some standard ones. But sometimes uh, an advertiser may want to say, OK, now I want to restrict everyone else from using it in this particular geographic region. They have to pay more for that. And so now it's, it's, the other, it's the other side who put those terms on. So they've got to be able to handle those types of negotiations. So yeah, in general, yes, though, they have kind of a standard set of rights that you maybe can add some things to. If you go to the Corbis site, the last time I kind of went through and tried to check out, there's this big check, you know, how are you going to use it? What's the circulation? All these types of things. Any other, I think there was a, any other um, restrictions or, or rights that you want to assert, you have to fill them in and then they, that's handled manually. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is kind of talk to you a little bit about the background of kind of what we've done uh, over the last five or six years in this area and kind of where we're going, 
how we view this problem. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about architecture and interoperability. We've got a, a series of papers on, on uh, DRM architectures and, inter and the interoperability problem uh, that I can uh, point to. And then I'll spend more time on this uh, game theoretic approach to studying this problem and, and a, a particular mechanism that we're uh, looking at trying to build out now uh, for actually um, implementing a particular game in this area. And then, um, you know, we've been struggling with this issue of the fact that uh, DRM now is, uh, you know, just on the surface. People hate it. We need, a, we need another name. <laughs> so we're calling it usage management, but it actually makes sense to think about this uh, usage management as uh, cloud architectures and, and things like this are evolving. Uh, if you look at these mashup engines that are provided by Yahoo Pipes or um, uh, what are some of the other ones that are out? There's a couple of different mashup engines. You know, there's there's nothing there provided for how people might use that content going forward, and or um, uh, I, I maybe I don't want my content mashed with a pornographic site. Right now, that happened. That happened with um, there was a conservative website where they. I can't remember the exact mashup. They ended up mashing it with pornographic material and then representing it, right? Things like that, right? So you would like to be able to specify those types of terms. They're completely lacking in that. So, uh, and as we go to cloud and, and, and people are actually providing data through the cloud or other services, you'd like to be able to wrap some uses terms around that. So I think this is a very interesting area for research going forward. So I'll talk about a couple of scenarios that where we have um, uh, found that if, if somebody could build this infrastructure, it could enable some very new business models. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we're trying to figure out how, how you think about usage management, what parts should live where, and how you could start to build systems around this. So that's, this, this part at the end is kind of more, uh, it's uh, a little bit um, rough at the moment. I mean, we, this, is, this is an area where we're just trying to think through some things at the moment. So, a few years ago, we looked at this problem of, of DRM and the offerings that were out there, and we proposed this layered framework for DRM as a way of, of thinking about um, the different solutions that people are offering in this space. And this paper en ended up, you know, we presented at the CCS at the, at the DRM workshop, and a lot of people have cited this paper because um, if, you look at, if you look at how most DRM systems were built, they were thought of as end-to-end -end systems as well. And if you look at, if you read some of the literature that came out of, for example, XRML, um, the Extensible Rights Markup Language, or ODRL, the way they, they proceed is they'll present a use case. And they'll say, um, e-books, e-books are emerging. We need to handle e-books. And they'll handle it from, you know, from the, the, the entire cycle of how somebody might want to deal with an e-book. They try and build that into the language. And that didn't make a lot of sense to us because there's a, there's, you should be able to partition this up. You know, how you handle the enforcement of rights, how you handle the specification of rights, what happens at the application level, all of these types of things should be partitioned. And, and we, we talked about this layered framework where you would just try to you know, put, so this is the rights expression interpretation layer, for example, and, and it should deal with the negotiations layer. These, you know, what happens here shouldn't mix with here. This whole, whole notion of the layer framework is a uh, very popular design pattern. So these are the two proto protocol stacks that we came up with. Uh, and we, in fact, we even overlaid uh, the Windows Media, Media Rights Manager. We actually showed how this would fit into the, to this framework here. Uh, in one of the papers that we wrote, just trying to push the fact that we need to think about what level you're working at. So we, th we, we talked about this is the digital rights enforcement layer. So this is kind of the, up, the cryptography, these types of things. The lower level is where you're getting into the machine uh, and, and you know, in, maybe at the operating system level and here you're you know, interacting with physical hardware. So, and you can, you can start to think about perhaps at some point companies that would do things in these particular you know, somebody would specialize like you see in the networking area. Somebody would specialize it here, here, you know, these types of things. And I think with some of these trusted computing platforms and things like that, I mean, I think we're starting to see some of the things developed, you know, here that maybe some type of rights expression or interpretation could ride on top of. <clears throat> uh, yes? Your negotiations. So, negotiates with so basically, uh, 
I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this later on, but in this negotiations layer, uh, w what we said should happen in this rights expression and interpretation, it should be pure rights. You know, there is a right to do something. It shouldn't specify, um, you know, what happens in a particular environment. So, so you have uh, a right to render a particular piece of content in a secure environment. Now you have to determine, at the next layer, you'd have to determine, all right, what is a secure environment? And so maybe we're negotiating back and forth. All right, I have these credentials. Um, you know, there's this list of the ones I, you know, if you'll, um, yes, that's a secure environment. If you'll download this patch, then I'll provide this kind of, those are the types of negotiations we're envisioning that would take place. But should be clearly separated from, and has nothing to do with expressing rights. So rights should be interpreted you know, independent of these things. And so, you know, a, a particular right could mean uh, a particular action in one environment and a completely different action in a different environment, and you have to handle that through negotiations. Yes. Well, we'll yeah, we'll, it's not really part of the game theory, but we'll, we'll talk a bit about this. So uh, one of the things that we found, though, and I, I've already mentioned this, is that um, there was a very interesting work done. I was at a, at a Siebold conference in the late 90s. And Amazon was there, McGraw-Hill, there's a bunch of others. This is, a big, this is when DRM was going to be big. <laughs> and a bunch of people stood up and said, we're going to start using DRM when it's standardized. That's when we're going to use it. <laughs> and um, you know, so, so you saw a lot of effort at that point in time from there was, there was uh, Xerox Park created this digital property rights language that eventually morphed into XRML, uh, which was a, a content guard company, which was a, a joint uh, venture between uh, Microsoft and Xerox. And this XRML has gone, you know, it went from being a Lisp based to, X, to XML based and uh, adopted eventually by MPEG 21. It's actually part of the MPEG 21 standard. All right. Uh, ODRL was created, they were, they were uh, also XML based, it, it kind of had a similar uh, genealogy except that they were very concerned about keeping everything open. And so uh, again, if you look at what they, they've done though, they've, the, the, there's a core language, there's a core to XRML, and every time somebody wants to add something, they, they, they put an extension on. And so what ends up happening is you have this huge, um, you know, it, it, in fact, if you go to some of these conferences, the, a lot of the papers say, well, I wanted to do this in XRML, but I couldn't do it. <laughs> so here's an extension. Now we fix it. Now we've, And so you, you get this bloat taking place of these languages. Um, if you look at rights expression languages, they're extremely complex. There's a couple of papers out there by, um, uh, where is that group? Vicki Wiseman wrote them um, with her uh, advisor. I'm it's escaping me at the moment, but basically where they tried to reverse engineer XRML and try and figure out what logic was underlying it. And it was incredibly complex to try and figure that out. And our, our approach is that we should maybe work forward and try and figure out a logic that makes sense and just have the few things that, that we need. So um, it, 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 what's happened is that XRML, ODRL, they're, they're much more than rights expression uh, tools. I mean, they're, they're complete languages. Uh, they have things in them that have m much more to do than, than rights. I mean, there's license management in the core. Tracking is part of ODRL. Uh, there's actually one of the tags in, in XRML is RSA something or other. So, I mean, they've actually built the type of encryption that, you know, you should be using right into the language itself. And that's, that's, that's kind of a difficult thing to do. Uh, it makes it very fragile going forward. Um, as new environments, I mean, I don't think people even thought much about uh, some of the, the computing environments we have right now, five or six years ago even. And so it makes it very difficult for these to, to advance and move forward. They have so much baggage to carry with them. So this is kind of the picture that uh, we, we had in one of our papers about the fact that, you know, if you're going to, these rights expression languages, you know, payment mechanisms, the, the data associated with this is built right into the language. And so if you want to make, uh, if you want to use them, I mean, you've got to provide maybe the logic to do this, but then, you know, in, you're tying into that language and then you have to hope that somebody who's going to use this is also going to um, 
uh, have an XRML interpreter as part of what they're doing, so on and so forth. So it became very difficult. We've been a proponent of making a very small rights core and, and pure rights, push everything else outside of that. We've got a couple of papers that discuss this topic. Um, and so that's, that's uh, this would be at that layer that I showed you previously, that rights expression and interpretation layer. And this is the student I was talking to you about previously who was trying to develop just a very simple framework for doing simple rights. Uh, if you're going to do something more complicated on top of that, it should be moved into a different layer. <clears throat> so that's kind of the architectural work we've done. Um, we started, uh, you know, one of the problems that we, we've uh, saw is that a lot of DRM systems have been kind of designed with only taking the perspective of one side of the equation. I haven't really thought about the, the, the user side in many cases. If you put you know, most of the DRM systems that people have tried to push out there, they've been, you know, textbook or, or book or music companies or something like that have been concerned about how do they protect their content. And so we wanted to kind of say, all right, what if we wanted to take into account everybody's concerns in this scenario? Um, and so we said, let's try and figure out if we can kind of model the decision making that might take place in these DRM environments using game theory. And just to set the background to this, because um, the Recording Industry Association of America for sure is using some, some and who knows, maybe they get together and, and actually try and use game theory to say, hey, if we hit them this hard, uh, you, can, you can see the charts, the, the graphs they get after a lawsuit, the file sharing drops off and then it you know, goes up higher than it was even before. And then they sue again, and, right? These are the things, and, and music sales are still, uh, of CDs in particular, are still dropping uh, significantly. So um, the RIAA sent out these pre-lawsuit notices to 20 uni 22 universities, and the reason they also sent them to UNM. And, uh, in the case of UNM, they said, we want the identities of these 17 students. Um, and they do it by IP address. And then the university is supposedly compelled to tell them who they are, and then they, they send them a nasty letter. Um, somebody fought it. I, this was, this was, and the thing about it is, is if the RIAA wins, they need to publicize it because they, they, they need to, uh, this is their method for trying to decrease the amount of file sharing that takes place. She, she fought it and lost $9,000 a song. I looked at the songs she downloaded too. They weren't that good, so I don't think it was worth it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, another thing that's happened is uh, it turned out that American Gangster, when it came out a couple years ago, and this happens, these, these uh, pre-release leaks happen all the time from people who work in the movie studios. You could actually just go down LA and for five bucks you could get that movie uh, before it was even released. Uh, there's almost every movie now you can go online and find it in this fashion. Yeah, you can get Windows for like a couple of bucks somewhere in, in some other country. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> same thing, same thing with software. Uh, you know, and by the way, you know, I mentioned the fact that, okay, there's, we should think of managing usage and rights in a more general context than, than just music, but now I'm going <laughs> to come back and say, well, even for that, if we think about it a little di differently, maybe we end up with different architectures. Uh, but still, I'd, I'd like to reiterate that point that if there's, there's a much broader ecosystem for managing rights than just music or, or consumer-based content. <clears throat> this was uh, at the beginning of the, the right? And I love, I love the, uh, uh, I was watching a cartoon with my daughter a couple years ago and, and the, the whole, uh, it was a Disney cartoon. And the whole idea was there was this kid who was going to download. And all his parents, or all his friends, excuse me, were just so concerned and how much that was going to ruin his life if he just downloaded. And, and there was just this big moral dilemma. And, you know, so they, they're, they're, there's, there's, there's some websites, too, that have the videos that have been produced by, they're hilarious. I mean, there's, the one, the one of the funniest one is, don't copy that floppy. <laughs> that one's a, a famous one on the web. So t take a look at those. These are the types of things they do to try and uh, persuade you, I guess, use moral arguments or something. Um, so what we did is we said, let's try and just capture these things in some type of a, a, a game theoretic form and see, see what we end up with. 
And so, you know, it's very simple the way we, we set this up. Um, you've got interactions between vendors of, of content and the consumers of content. And we're assuming just some type of electronic commerce setting. Um, and then we look at the different strategies that are being deployed, the, 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 the legal action, um, the in, you know, incentives, other things like that, and how we might capture those. Um, and then try to figure out, okay, what are the, the, um, uh, the consequences that should be produced if you take particular actions. And then we said, well, let's, we've, we've introduced a, a, a different uh, architecture that perhaps leads to a different solution to these games. And one of the things I'll do is I'll talk about this trust authority, although I think trust is maybe not the right type of name. I'm trying to, what I say there is, that maybe I, I will want to, I'm trying to measure uh, how much I trust how you'll use the content. All right, so I'll talk about this. It's not the traditional trust authority. It's, it's, it's how much do I trust your usage. Uh, and so we'll talk about how you might make that uh, infrastructure fit within a game theoretic setting and see how you end up with different solutions to that. So, so, well, oh my, yes. There's one thing in the previous slides that bothers me. I guess I'm going to see how much it does. The word rational. <laughs> so you assume that in you assume that in game theory, you always assume the players uh, are rational. Yeah, no, so that's yeah, uh, that's an assumption always. Does it keep the room? Yeah, yeah. No, well, yeah. Right, so you always assume people kind of know yeah. the rules of the game and that they're not going to they're not going to act. Um, you assume that that the players will act in their own best self-interest, right? But then you look how people vote some days and you realize that they're not acting in their own interest. So who knows, <laughs> right? Uh, so so here's the we 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 partition this into two sub games. There's the content acquisition, and then there's how you use the content. So you, you as a, a consumer of content have two choices, right? You have two decisions, you know, where am I going to get it? And once I get it, what am I going to do with it? And so we wanted to break those two up into two sub games. And then we end up creating this repeated game and trying to see where, if, you know, if you are continually doing this, where do you end up? So we want to do this to try and model kind of long-term interactions, um, how uh, through those long-term interactions, one of the things I might be able to do is learn something about you. And when I learn something about you, maybe I can differentiate the offers that I make to you. This is something that certainly doesn't exist now, although it, it exists in other areas, right? People give you better offers if you're a good a customer, if they, if they get to know you, right? Not here. I mean, you're not going to get a better offer at, at iTunes or something like that just because um, you use content the right way. So um, we'll look at two types of repeated games. I'll, I'll kind of go over that quickly. Um, you know, there's two ways we can extend that. Here's the basic idea for the game. You've got a, a, a consumer, you've got a vendor, so the consumer can either pay or download that content, and the vendor can either provide it with, with technical protection or without technical protection. And in any of these cases, the, um, the uh, you know, this is this utility that the consumer gets for paid, right? This, this path was paid with technical protection. There's the, the utility that the vendor gets out of that same action. So this I'm just using to denote the utilities if you end up at these nodes. And so these are the three, I'm going to refer to these three nodes later in the talk. So I've got this one where it's paid with technical protection is one, without is two, and I just downloaded it, that's three. And so those, that's very simple, right? And, and even with this, we can say, all right, so what happens if you have perfect DRM? And this is what, uh, you know, you, I'm sure you remember, you know, 10 years ago or something, there were a lot of companies that would say, we, we have unbreakable system, right? <laughs> Nobody's going to break our system, right? And so, uh, you know, the nice thing about unbreakable systems is you can, right? I mean, you... you, you yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's the one thing you are. <laughs> yeah. So, right, at some time, Let's call it tau, the content is first uh, made available. There's no option to download it, right? And as long as, as long as the vendors always supply technical protection, right? Subsequent plays of the game will be identical. Nothing changes. It's a beautiful, well, I don't know if it's, it's beautiful from the vendor's perspective, right? They don't ever have to worry. And so this is why a lot of, I think, companies made those claims. A lot of vendors fell for it, right? Uh, they're in complete control, right? Um, the only utility you get is, is, right, the desirability of the content with technical protection, right? So set the price accordingly, and, and that's all there is to it, right? 
Then people say, well, you could crack these systems. And I remember these vendors would say, oh, well, that's OK. As long as you know, 90% of the time they're good, you know, you'll get 90% of these sales. Well, the problem is, of course, that with the internet and, and the, the, uh, the power law, <laughs> right, things spread fast. So let's look at the, the case of imperfect DRM, right? The content is available, right? You get one purchase, at least, right? Um, so, so nothing changed there. But uh, if we just make this assumption that this is the only assumption we make here is that, to, that these technical protection measures will reduce but not eliminate file sharing. <coughs> that's, that's what people would, would say at the time, right? So, you know, this is the, the, um, the vendors, you know, this is for, for purchasing with technical protection. This is a the utility they get. It's, it's more than the utility that they, if they offer it without technical protection, right? Although, you know, now you see some cases, for example, where Apple will sell you uh, non-DRM protected, but they'll charge you more for it, things like that. And uh, obviously, this is, be this is more than the utility that they get f if, if somebody just downloads it, right? So the interesting thing is that these are diametrically opposed to C's preferences. I mean, C's, you know, flip these around, and C is, C is the other way around on this. They're going to get the most utility, assuming there's no moral issues here. They're, obviously, you're going to get the most utility out of downloading it because it didn't cost you anything, assuming the content is the same. Now, if I inject malware into it, it's a different matter. I'd be willing to pay to get something that doesn't have that. So this is one of the strategies that's applied, right? You know, if you just put, if you just pick some numbers and create this based upon, you know, just create this, this, you know, game where, where, right, this is the consumer vendor, you know, for paid with technical protection, you could put these, these utilities satisfy this as well as the customer's utilities. There's a Nash equilibrium right here for downloading without technical protection. If you think about this, there's no way that this, the consumer is going to move, right? They're not going to, they're, they're not going to move here. And um, the vendor is the second one, right? They, they're not going to move off of that position either. So that, that establishes that there would be a Nash equilibrium in this case. Um, actually, it's here, sorry. Right? They're not going to move. They're not going to move. OK. So. Uh, you know, just making some simple assumptions, you know, putting some numbers in there, right, that, uh, for example, the user's going to get, the consumer's going to get more utility out of, of downloading than if they purchase it, right? The vendor, right, gets more utility if they purchase it. If you put these in, then you can kind of argue that, well, it makes the most sense to just download it. Um, so for Establishing that Nash equilibrium, I just showed you. The critical thing is that the 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 um, utility of this consumer for downloading, right? The relationship between that and, and the the utility they get out of paying for something with technical protection or some other measure. All right, that's that's the key thing. That's if you if you change that, that equilibrium point will move. Okay, so um, right this the, the case that I just showed you. This was the situation, and the, the Nash equilibrium corresponded to downloading, right? So the problem with this, this is kind of an argument that if you try for perfect DRM but miss it a little bit, and the content's available, all right, anybody who can download should. All right? So the only way to change this situation is to figure out how to make this greater than that, make the utility for purchasing greater. How do you do that, right? Well, you have to violate this initial assumption, this initial assumption that content is the same whether I get it from either place, right? And so um, it, there's two ways to do that. And this is one of the things we talked about in th this paper we presented. Um, you can have a carrot or a stick. And so far, the stick has been what's been used, right? So um, in either case, we're trying to move the Nash equilibrium up here, right? Here. Uh, what we're doing is we're giving the, the consumer a lot more utility for purchasing, right? Here, uh, here we're giving them... You're lowering it. Yeah, we're lowering it. It's the other way around. Yes, yes. Yeah, right? So, and, and in, the, in the case of the stick, right, the, we're, we're upping the penalty. So, we're, right, so we're making... These are the lawsuits, for example. We make them worse and worse, and we really, really come, come down on you. All right? So um, that, that's kind of the, the sub game we looked at 
we'll, let, let's, let me talk about what happens after you obtain the content. Let's put these two together and then let's talk about where we might drive this, this game. All right? Um, you know, the, the only summary from that first part of this discussion is that and if, you, if you've got 100% copy proof technology, by God, use it because you know, that's the only way it's going to make sense for this. And there's this I found not long ago. There's still some folks out there claiming 100% safe from all screen capture, which is crazy. <laughs> you can still look it up. You can still find some. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. Uh, so now um, <clears throat> let's look at some ways of kind of implementing these, these carrot and, and stick approaches. Um, so first, let's let's look at right here's a, this node I was one of those three nodes from the previous game. Here's the consumer. Here's the vendor. This is uh, denoting that they shared the content, and this is they didn't share the content. In either case, in either case, the vendor can take action or or do nothing, and they get utility out of of, of each of those actions. Now this right this is the kind of the, the typical thing. I, I shared the content. And the vendor's got to decide if they can detect it, what they do about it. All right. What's what's if you don't share the content, you know what happens here? I mean, typically there's there's no action taken. One of the interesting things we wanted to look at is what if we do, as a vendor, take some action if I can detect that you're a good customer. What, what was it, I? I was one of those three nodes from the previous game. So, oh, oh, the, the, there were three nodes there. So I could be one through three. It's the you know purchase with technical protection without or download. Those are the three things. Right, so what's kind of interesting is if you say one SI, that's I paid with technical protection, I shared it, and uh, we took action. The vendor took action. So this could be, you know, somebody cracked uh, iTunes. Uh, it was determined, and now you can use the Digital Millennium Copyright Act to actually prosecute under that case. Right? Um, if you go to two, right, SA, that's the second one. I, I downloaded it without technical protection. I shared it. Uh, didn't take action, right? So here's Apple EMI. Those were the ones that were offered without technical protection um, and n you know no consequences. Here's downloading, right? I shared it and I got a RIAA letter saying I owe them money, right? And, and I had heard at one point, by the way, that the only way that they get you is if if you're downloading, they'll never do anything. It's only they only look for uploads. And I think I've heard. I don't know if this is true, that the legal reason for that is that you know, if you own a CD, for example, of some music, then you have every right to, to download that CD uh, if you don't want to rip it yourself. So I guess if, if you're simply downloading these things and they, they call you, you can say, well, I, you know, go out and buy those CDs, I guess, and say, no, I... Was that true with DVD, too? No. Uh, well, in the, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act says if you, so I think the issue there is if you use an anti-circumvention device. Yeah, that was the change. Yeah. This CSS thing. Yeah. Yes. It, it was the DMCA made it a crime to work around technical protection. Yes. Correct. In this or the DMCA. Yeah. Yes. yes. It was a cat and mouse game. Yeah. And you were allowed. That's still the status quo? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, so before you, you were allowed to, and it always held up in court, you could make backups. Uh, you could claim you were making a backup, right? Yeah. But, but now they outlawed that whole step of, of actually, um, you know, if you, if you crack it, it doesn't matter what it's being used for. You're just not allowed to crack technical protection anymore, unless you're at a university and doing research. So, <laughs> which happened in one case. Somebody downloaded and I said, hey, we're doing research. And the, the attorneys at UNM were like, what? And I said, there's a provision in the DMCA. Look it up. And they did. And I said, well, then just send us a letter saying you were so we can respond to these guys. So, <laughs> so now they tell me, anytime you're going to do any type of that testing, just let us know. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so anyways, uh, this last one's kind of interesting, right? Node 3, download, and you didn't share. Then you're what they call a freeloader or a leech, which is... Uh, I can't remember the numbers. It's a huge percentage of the users of these things are free to, freeloaders. Um, and, and there's a game that's being played by the folks who run these, these, these sharing sites, too. They, they have their own strategy that they're employing. If you share more, people tend to share more with you, right? Um, there's some other things that they do where they can rate you and do these types of things. So they're trying to also uh, influence behavior through those mechanisms. 
So it's interesting if you think of this from a game theoretic perspective, how everybody's trying to, to move how you behave. <clears throat> so what kind of actions? Let's think about the actions the vendor can take, right? Legal attacks. I call this the nuclear option because it's, I mean, you don't want that dropped on you. Uh, it's expensive for them to drop it, but it looks like it messes up your life pretty good if they, if they get you. Um, if, just as a side note, it's kind of interesting. Every once in a while, you'll see a college student, like I saw one in the LA Times, an op-ed piece saying, you know, don't share files. It's a bad thing and all of these. And they, you know, they got caught and this is the, we're not going to make you pay, but you're going to have to write this, you know. Th those are the types of things these guys are doing. Uh, technology attacks are very, um, there's actually some companies out there that market their, their services in doing this. And so, um, let me see if it's right here, is one of them called Media Defender, right? Uses a range of non-invasive technological countermeasures employed on P2P networks to frustrate users' attempts to steal and trade copyrighted content. They have a proven track record. They're decoying, so, so they'll, you'll download a song, but it's not the song you thought it would be. Or there's one I play sometimes where uh, Madonna, um, I, has anybody heard this one? It's hilarious. It starts playing her song and then all of a sudden it stops and she says, what the f are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there's one, there's, so I've, I collect these, I've got some good ones. There's one that'll just, it's playing a song, I think it's by Counting Crows, and then all of a sudden it just blasts a, a, a loud, you know, high-pitched tone. Uh, things of that nature. Or, you're, or they just mess up the tags. You know, you're downloading something, but you're getting something else. So, but um, the, uh, these are defeatable by um, group rating techniques on the files, right? They're hash so, identified, yes. so they just go, this is bad. Yeah, so, so, that's, that, so th this, think of that as part of this game. So part of the game is, you know, the next step is how, how you rate content and you do these types of things, right? So that's, that's the countermeasure. Yeah, it is. It is the cat and mouse game for sure. Um, so they also have this leak alert service, you know. Uh, there's, you know, I, I would be very interested to see if I could figure out how much uh, use, because I think there's a, lot, there's a lot of malware sitting out there, and I'm not sure what the legal line is there. Uh, but I, I'm just curious. I'd, I'd like to figure out how much these companies make from the record labels and, and so forth on just tr trying to make it more difficult. I, I, bet they, I bet they do okay. So these things, these are the stick side of that equation that we talked about. Um, so there's other, other approaches. I talked about that, that whole lower side of that game where there's other things you might be able to do. Let's look at this RIA one. Um, this is the node three, the nuclear option we talked about. Here's a letter. You can go online and find some of these letters, right? Uh, we have asked your ISP to forward this letter to you in advance of filing a lawsuit. Basically what happens is uh, if you'll pay them $750 for each song you download, they won't sue you, is, is what it ends up being. <laughs> so, well, it, they'll settle for less. They, yeah, once you contact them once and start talking them, with them, it's a different, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Cool. well it, cool. so right a couple of interesting things have happened recently. If you, um, so one is that there was uh, somebody in the IT at University of Georgia who was uh, basically taking, taking money from students saying, I can make these things go away. So he got caught. They actually set up a sting and, and nailed this guy. And so I, you know, I guess he would just say, hey, that ISP address doesn't belong, you know, it's a mistake or something, can't find it or something like that. So he was taking, taking this money in order to make the problem go away. The second one I just talked to you about was, uh, there was a, I think it was at UPenn, a professor named Usher, same name as a, a musical artist, and he and, and his a cappella group had made a song about some constellation or something like that. And that MP3 file was sitting in some shared space along with his name, Usher. And so they assumed that this was an Usher song. And they sent him a, a, a cease and desist letter demanding money. And, um, you know, they responded. And, and they, if you look at the, one of these sites, they, they have the actual letter from the RIAA saying this is the first time they've admitted a mistake in what they're doing. And they sent him a, uh, an Usher t-shirt, I think, in response or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> so uh, these are, these are, these are the, this is what they're doing, right? Um, very severe action. I mean, if you think about this, right, the, the utility the consumer gets, right, if, if, no, is, if, if no action is taken is, is hugely different than if action is taken, right? 
But same for the vendor. This is a very expensive thing to do, right? They're kind of loath to take this because the utility they get out of, of taking action is much lower generally if they just sit there for that one particular person. I mean, they're trying to affect a population. But for that person, they're spending more on attorneys than what they're getting probably from that person. Um, so you know, you can model it this way, right? Um, and if you think of this as a population of users, I mean, there's this huge penalty for sharing. And action is taken right, on the part of the, the uh, consumer, right? Uh, <clears throat> so in this case, you can get these two, you'll get two pure strategy Nash equilibrium, although this one's not rational if you think about it because, um, you know, action is taken for not sharing. That doesn't, doesn't make sense in this penalty one. It makes sense maybe in, in, in what we're going to talk about shortly. It does make sense, but in this penalty case, not really. So uh, to make that nuclear threat credible, however, what you have to do is you have to, you have to, um, play a mixed strategy. You have to randomize this. You have to pick some folks here, and you don't know when it's going to hit you. <laughs> All right? That's how you can, can drive things to something different. And so if we just pick the payoff, you know, I picked 100, negative 100 in that last one. And if, if you plug that in, that seems kind of reasonable. It's 100, 100 times worse for me than for, um, you know, the vendor. Maybe that's, maybe, I don't know. That, that, that seems to make sense. If you say it's 100 times worse, right? then you come up with this expected utility. And if you plug in just uh, if, if, if the probability that you, so let's, this nuclear option, right? I'm going to uh, file a lawsuit with probability Q. If I plug that in, just only about 4% of the time do I need to attack and to make it effective, right? Just keeping me guessing that alone, right? That this discounts this notion of once I do do it, how much publicity I get out, you know, how much publicity do I make of this, right? So uh, the other thing that, you, that the consumer may want to do is try to think about playing a mixed strategy as well, but that doesn't really change anything here, right? The other question is how much, you know, let's, let's increase the penalty. Let's make it 1,000 times worse. Then it's 0.4% of the time. Yes? Yes? I think there is a mixture of two games here. Wait, wait, wait. One game, if I am a single consumer. Yes. Is that more or less your framework? Yes. Another game where there's a population of consumers yes. and a vendor. Yes. So from the vendor's point of view, this is the real game. Yes. And your probabilistic stuff doesn't quite capture because because in your probabilistic picture, the consumers either does this, does this with such probability, does that with such probability. So in the real, in, in the concept, more realistic game, so there's a certain proportion of users does this, certain proportion of users does that. Yes. And the vendor um, computes how much he gets from that portion, from that portion, from that portion. So it is more. Yeah, I mean, you know, the way that I talked about here is to let's think about this as a population. So, um, you know, you, so the, the vendor thinks about the, the consumers as a population and picks at random, you know, 0.4% uh, of the time, I'm going to pick somebody that I find downloading to sue that person. I mean, I think the way they actually do this is they look for the, the, somebody who's, you know, a heavier infringer in many cases to, to pick it, to make an example. Suppose but I'm a vendor. Yes. So I have so many people downloading, so many people yeah. paying, so many and so I consider all these populations, yes. and then I sum with weights. I take a yes. weighted sum of what yes. I get, okay. and then there's a certain amount of money which I want to maximize. So it's really an opti optimization game where you want to, 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 to get optimal. You have to build that into the, um, to the utility function. Yes. Um, so it's a slightly more... I, <sighs> You know, I have to think about that, if you might model that more accurately. I mean, I, mean, I think this captures this notion that, the, that there's a population of users out there. The idea from the vendor's perspective is really there's this population of people who are either sharing or not sharing. And they're focused on just the ones that are sharing and picking. Maybe they even subdivide that into the ones that they think they should make examples of. But, but, but I think it, 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 to make that more 
realistic you would build that into the utility function on how you might try to... Yeah, the, the basic difference is that in, in the probabilistic picture, the con consumer does or does not. And in the slightly more complicated, which I, I think is yeah. still analyzable yeah. picture, portion of the user, yeah, yeah, yeah. Group, portion yeah. of the user right, don't, right, 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 right. and then you take... I agree. You come yeah, I agree. Okay. So the you know one of the issues here is that you're, there's only so much you can you know, there's legal limits on how much you can what you can do to somebody if they file share right I think they're pushing that about as far as we can um, so you know let, now let's look at the situation is what, what happens if instead you tried to reward good behavior this is something that uh, I haven't really seen anybody I don't know if anybody's an example of where somebody is rewarded for using content appropriately. Any example you can think of? I can't really. <laughs> I mean, they re maybe reward you for purchasing, but reward you for actually not sharing. Yeah, no, there have been cases where, like, if you buy the DVD, they include the MP4 version on the disc, yes, right? Yes, yes. But I can't think of a reward for not sharing. The only sharing. thing I can think which I know that sure is a reward. They sometimes send you coupons, although you can look at the spam. So see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But you could but still share. Fundamentally uh, differentiated yeah. between those two cases where right. yeah. you just yeah. buy something, you, you pay me money, and that's how I track your good behavior. Yeah. You yeah. paid right. me, so I know you paid me, so yeah. here I have something good. Yeah. But you differentiated that from you paid me and you and, paid this. <coughs> and so the problem is there's no tracking system yeah. for that right. second yeah. part. So, so, so the, the, these are the usage terms I have with this content, and I can tell that you're respecting them. So. I'm going to try and reward you for that. So that's kind of how we set this up to see if we could, right, move this from, you know, not sharing because I took positive action versus this situation where I took negative, you know, the, 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 this is the carrot, this is the stick essentially. All right. So, you know, you can, you can construct utilities to drive the game to, to, to that as well. Um, and one of the things we look, we look to do in this repeated game is to, you know, what are some strategies that actually could drive you to particular forms of behavior, right? So what we'll do is we'll form this repeated game by putting these two games together now. So now, right, we've got the, the, the sub-game for content uh, acquisition, and then here's the sub-game for how it gets used, and these are, you know, all of the different outcomes you could get from this, right? And there's these Nash folk theorems that say, basically, for these types of repeated games, it's possible to drive the game to any, you know, depending upon the types of rewards you offer, you can drive the game wherever you want. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> the, the big notion that you're trying to capture in these repeated games is this reciprocity. You know, I, 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 I can tell you've done something, and there's a couple of different ways you can, uh, if you've ever seen the, the prisoner's dilemma, for example, there's the the grim strategy that once is that the grim you know as soon as as soon as somebody turns on you you never trust them again right um, so the current situation we have with respect to this is that this no good deed goes unpunished if you right or no bad deed excuse me goes unpunished if I catch you I'm going to nail you but there's no good deed that goes unrewarded that we we're thinking let's see if we can create something around that all right <clears throat> that's kind of the Radiohead experiment in, in essence but it not the usage part, right? But they're, they're trying to say, um, you know, there's other models here, right? So, as I have already mentioned, these Nash folk theorems tell us, you know, that you can get some equilibrium behave, some equilibrium amount, in any behavior in this game, all right? But you have to set the appropriate triggers in order to do that, all right? So, um, what, one of the things I, you know, and, and we haven't shown this formally, is it's very difficult to obtain equilibrium around that nuclear option. Right, and uh, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. And in fact, I think that's that's kind of what's being shown. Right, as more and more time goes by, CD sales continue to drop, and it's right. So let's let's look at how we might repeat this game. We can fix the content and vary the consumers. Right now, you're looking at a population. Um, you yes. Um, I think this uh, the other game <laughs> gives you more opportunities because. In, in addition to making this new Which game now? The a game where you, you play with a, with a, yes. with one side is a complicated yes. population. Yes, yes, yes. And you optimize all. So, in, say, say I'm a, a vendor, instead of just doing nuclear version, yeah. a, a nuclear option, I can do less nuclear, 
But to how many of them? Yeah. So there is another yeah. parameter. I mean, I, I, the, the... Wait, wait, wait. And another thing is positive behavior. If you place, say, say Hungarians were very good. Uh -huh. <laughs> Not necessarily one particular Hungarian, yeah, 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 but yeah. as a population. Yeah. Then you can reward, yes. say, on your side, you put Hungarian colors. Yeah, I mean, you, <laughs> yeah, I see. Or, um, I mean... You know, there's the potential to use this to kind of characterize populations about, I'm, I'm willing to make these types of deals with this population. Right. Which, I, you know, I, there's because a whole bunch open, of another can of worms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That goes along with that. So that's a good point. Yeah. That's like, given that this count to Microsoft employees. Yeah. Yeah, th but. Yeah. But that, is, that, is, that sort of presupposes, uh, its effectiveness presupposes the population's ability to influence yes. each other as a unit. Yeah. Otherwise, it's pointless to Well, or it could be just, the, the different cultures have different ways of looking at intellectual property. It's far different in, in the U.S. than in China. But the question example. is, are you in Billy's room when he's downloading so you can go, no, no, Billy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I want yeah, my yeah. discount. Yeah. yeah. You're not there, so you can't really. Yeah, oh, I see, yeah. <laughs> Well, we tried to kind of capture this notion in this repeated game, right, where, where um, you know, we're fixing the content and we're saying, so there's a piece of content, but we're looking at, we didn't break up into populations, as you mentioned, which I, I think does, does make sense. Um, and we just wanted to look at how that particular piece of content spread. And then we said, well, let's fix the, the, the con let's, let's fix the, uh, the uh, let's vary the content and look at how we can influence a single person. In this, so those are the two ways we could do this, right? So you know, in the in this first one, you might try this forgiving trigger, where you know, if, if they do something bad, eventually it, it'll it'll t uh, trail off, and you could set up a a, a discount factor in this, and um, you can actually go through this and figure out at, at by plugging in these discount factors, I won't go into details on this, you can actually try and force this game to a particular solution. Right? And, and basically the idea is picking the right discount factor for this, getting, getting an accurate enough model. Right? Um, so this was, a, this was kind of an infrastructure that we put together to try and do that. <laughs> and uh, this is something that we're working on, kind of an ongoing. The idea is that... Um, I offer, I'm a content vendor and I offer you content. And when I offer you content, right, the c customer requests some content, and I call this trust authority, but again, I think there's maybe a better name for this. Um, uh, this content vendor collects some information, uh, user ID or something of that nature, and it goes to this third party trust authority and it says, okay, tell me, tell me the, the, the credit rating or trust rating of, of this person, usage rating, whatever we want to call it. All right, tell me, tell me what you think. And uh, based upon that, we'll collect this content. I'm going to fingerprint it according to who this customer is. And one of the things that we show here, too, is maybe part of the thing that goes into trying to figure out this customer trust is just third party, third party information you might have. Or it could be from just more likely by looking at how things, how this, I sell you a song, for example. I go to a file sharing network and I find it there the very next day. That might, in, in this algorithm that we're using to try and figure out the trust, right? I don't find it there for uh, three months. Well, it could be that you went to a party, shared your music, which you should be able to do. F looks like it's fair use, but somebody else took it and, and posted it someplace, all right? Probably fair use. But if I find that you're doing this with every piece of content, you know, maybe I change this ranking system. So the notion is that we try and, f so what do we need to do this? So the notion is we're trying to, to observe your behavior by placing some personalized information, personalized information in the sense that we can identify a transaction, not necessarily you, all right? But we can identify a user of this system, perhaps anonymously, right? But we can figure out who they are and then uh, construct offers according to that. So <laughs> this is the framework that we, we put together. It requires, in order to do this, this notion that you, you can fingerprint uh, content in such a way that you know, later on you can find it. Now, um, this really does not require, I mean, p if people were to remove it or not, I mean, it just, 
slightly changes how well this might work. It doesn't completely break it like if you get imperfect uh, content protection, right? It, can, it completely breaks that. Um, one of the notions that we're investigating is if I were to sell you a collection of content objects, if I were to put p little pieces of information into each of those content objects and you rise a above a certain threshold at a certain point in time, maybe only then can I retain information about uh, the user that you are, not who you are personally, but this is user X, and I know next time X comes to this site, this is based upon their usage history, this is what uh, I'm going to give them. This is very similar, by the way, to how credit services work, right? If you try to purchase, a, uh, if you try to secure a mortgage, they look at your credit history and they make you offers based upon that. So this is a similar type of notion. So that's, that's one of the things that we're trying to build out of all of this is this notion of trying to allow this content vendor, based upon the information they receive from this ranking system, um, a better offer to you. So, you know, a lot of technical issues here, right? I mean, who puts this together? How do you get people to participate? Uh, is it even acceptable that, you know, you have to, uh, you know, to, to convince, you know, people to, 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 to even participate in something like that is difficult, I think. So. Any questions about this? This was kind of the what we ended up with with that system. Um, I'm gonna <clears throat> so uh, I'm gonna skip through this and just talk about one other thing. One of the things that we're kind of working on currently now is um, so we've tried to extend this notion of just usage management in general. And this is a term that we've coined, right? So we've been considering how rights and, and usage terms might be you know managed in these emerging infrastructures. And so this is the, the term that we're now using for this. This is kind of our current research. The long-term goal is to develop this technological infrastructure policies that facilitate automated usage. You know, so it would apply to, for example, that photo stock, where you can reason over these things and, and, and take action uh, based upon um, terms that are agreeable to all parties involved in these data-centric transactions. And in fact, you could extend this to services as well, if you think about it, not just to data. but uh, you see that one more with cloud, <coughs> with cloud computing, where you can actually, you know, use a service. And the way that we're thinking about this is, is as follows: you know, we've we've had access control. So the usage management is kind of a combination, if you think about it, of access control and rights management. Um, we've had access control systems; they've been formally analyzed. There's, you know, very nice models where you can actually prove whether this access control policy matches this particular security policy. Um, we've coined this term action management for kind of talking about, okay, what actions will you allow to take place on that object or that service? And if you think about that, that's kind of what's happening, you know, when you put a license and then try to, try to control actions, that's what's happened with a lot of the bad DRM that we talked about in the beginning. They were trying to control your, your render action, but there's all sorts of other actions we can talk about um, that could be enabling even. All right? So this is kind of how we're looking at usage management is kind of the marriage of these two things. And let me give you a couple of use cases. Uh, we have a, a contract with the Air Force right now where military, military analysts, um, they like to do what they call, they, they like to put, they call it crap on a map. They want, to, they want a map and they want to pull a lot of things on that map and then they want to be able to you know, figure out what's going on based on that. And there's a real issue that they have in these multi-level security environments of, of trying to get access to this open source information along with this piece of uh, you know, secure information, or if I put these two pieces together, it moves it to this security classification, or it moves the lower one to the higher one. There's a lot of complication associated with that, but they really want to make use of these, you know, they call them the Web 2.0 technologies, in order to make the analyst job easier. And they really want to be able to access open source. They really like Google Maps. <laughs> um, so this is kind of the, you know, the framework that, that we're looking at for doing usage management in this case, is that you, know, you wrap these usage terms around the data unit. You need a mashup rule engine, something that we've you know, talked about that can take these terms and figure out what you can and can't do with those. And then you, you push out the mashed up instance here. One of the things that's not happening now, if you look at how people are doing mashups, there's the, the usage terms, you know, the combined usage terms logically have to be, you know, m remain with that. And so you need also a logical formalism to figure out how do you take these three things and produce a unified set of usage policy 
uh, you know, usage terms, right, in this wrapper. If you think about this, this really, it, you know, back in the old days of um, digital rights management, is very similar to the super distribution problem, where you want to be able to take content, put it together, and somebody can resell it. So this is the similar, similar type of a problem. It's the same issue. What's that? The civilian mapping industry. I, the, yeah. I remember getting, uh, folks were looking at geospatial data. It wasn't within the military context, but where Homeland Security wanted all the cities and towns to have maps available with like all the water and sewer mm -hmm. and everything else. And because the different layers were owned by different people with different usage rights, they couldn't even figure out how to bring it together. I ended up giving it an example of Bach, though, at one point. Really? Because they were, yeah, out of Colorado, actually. It was a group of Colorado was kind of running it. It was a standardization attempt on cheap rights and how they could possibly express uh, just usage rights for geospatial data. Huh. And, and, and it was really just a matter of every jurisdiction that was trying, you know, that owned data had different yeah. license rights. So, so, that, so, that, so that's interesting. In the military setting, you add one other th the security level, you have the clearance. And the access control, because right. here, here's a particular scenario they're interested in. There's somebody in, in let's say, Baghdad, and um, they, they're trying to order food. They're doing logistics. And they need to know who's there uh, in order to figure out. And, you know, and so they need, they need to know, they need to put that information on a map. But it's maybe a coalition partner doing this or somebody, and they don't particularly trust them. Uh, and so they'd like to give them the information who's there, but not very precisely. You know, you can figure out who's in the surrounding area. So they're going to pull the same, uh, say, GIS data, excuse me, uh, uh, GPS data from all the soldiers, for example. But then there's somebody doing mission planning over here. And same data, same map, but that person's role is different. That person needs to know you know, is this soldier in this house so that I can move him over here or something like that. So uh, just the role change in those cases, but the usage term should be able to figure out, okay, based upon your role, here's what you're getting. And that's, that's the notion that we're trying to solve with this. And so I think some of the work you, you showed me today would fit into, fit into this. Uh, the other one, this monetization of personal medical records, this kind of occurred when I was at a, a talk at CCS and they were talking about HIPAA and how people want to protect their, you know, the big issue people always talk about is are they protecting your privacy of your medical records? And I thought to myself, well, you know, I, I'm, being, I'm willing to sell that. I'll sell my privacy, <laughs> right? I'm, why, why should you, why should, why should somebody else to keep that for? Why don't just let me monetize it? And so what we're trying to create is this exchange where, and, and there's a lot of, uh, this, this I, I, I think might be an interesting cloud application as well because there's a lot of uh, places out there that are now collecting medical information. Like there's Google Health, there's Microsoft has, um, Microsoft Health, Microsoft Health, yeah. Um, there's uh, the other, other health related companies that have these things and, and the, the whole notion there is that that's your data. Um, you should be able to go to the hospital and if, they, if they've partnered up, you know, your records go. GE had that big, uh, during the Olympics, they had that commercial where the guy was sitting there and everybody was telling him what had happened. I don't know if you remember that. but So, uh, you know, the, the notion is that this hospital participates. You get, what, some x-ray taken, and it should go into your, your vault, for example. It's your data. And uh, we'd, we'd have a lot better health care, I think, if we could keep that stuff. So that's your data. Why shouldn't you be able to wrap your usage terms around it, saying, hey, I'm willing to participate in this study with Pfizer if they'll pay me whatever. And so Pfizer now can go and um, you know, negotiate those. So, so one of the things we want to create is this, nego oh, this, this negotiation framework that says, all right, I need X number of patients that have this medical condition. People with those medical conditions can say, hey, I'm willing to participate. I'm willing to supply my data if, if somebody's you know, willing to, to pay me for it. And so, that is, a, that is a, a case where clearly usage management matters because uh, once I provide that data to Pfizer, they need to tell me how it's going to be used and, and these types of things, and you'd like to be able to track that going forward. So that's another scenario that we're interested in. And then just kind of managing usage in the cloud. How, you, how might you do this? We've been trying to put and figure out you know, what are the right ways of trying to manage uses in the cloud. As a, right now, there's no way of, of putting uses terms around 
data or services and having them travel as people put these together. So this is similar to the mashup problem. You know, we've looked at trying to figure out a couple of ways of doing this, putting some type of a mashup gateway. So we're, we're looking at particular mashup, but using a cloud service to do it. And so you could have this mashup gateway that has the licenses for these sources. So if you're trying to do a mashup, you know, it, you actually have to, the, you don't actually supply content here. You kind of supply a pointer to this. That's kind of seems like the easiest, easiest way to, to get this done. The other option is that you can put licenses, put license, wrap the license around the data that you're allowing to be mashed up. And then you just put some type of a, an ID that has to be, you know, you have to obtain the ID from here in order to do the mashup in a particular program. So maybe you need to have the ID of this application as they do now in order to, to pull these things together so we can kind of track what's going on. And then the other one is to just, this is more kind of the browser plugin approach where um, you don't need the, the, the cloud to do it, but the intelligence has to be within your, your browser as a plugin in order to read the terms associated with this license. You have to have an engine. In either case, right, if you look at these previous ones, there's an engine here that can take these two and figure out, okay, here's the combined usage term that you'll get from this. Yes, you can do that here. Again, I think this is the, the notion of something, you, you showed me something similar to that today, yeah. right? So um, that's kind of how... All this stuff is getting... Whenever you have, you know, basically your attacker or your, yeah. your, your is the mashup program, your, yeah. your adversary, yeah. you want to make sure he behaves yeah. properly. And you're, he's going to be the guy in final control of, you know, cracking open the data yeah. and then observing yeah. the policy. Yeah. You have to trust him. To, yeah. to observe the policy, and so he has to be motivated to do so. But he's going to have that data. I agree, but but take look at the the photo stock problem in this case, right? The photo stock problem. If you had something like this, there's no adversary there. That's they just, you know. Right. In many cases, the yeah. client wants to conform. Yeah. So you can yeah. just help yeah. them to conform. Yeah. Here. I think it's the, the the hard cases where the client really doesn't want. And there, yeah. Then, <laughs> so now you have the security issue associated yeah. with this. Yeah. Yeah. So th that's kind of what we've been looking on. Just a couple, you know, there's only one other, you know, we, we're, so we're trying to figure out, all right, what are, what are, how do we really study usage from a, uh, you know, how do you break down the scenario of how people are using things and how do you identify, you know, what parts should go where in a particular environment. And so we spent some time just trying to, you know, just over the last few weeks, all right, what are, what are the types of usage that are out there? There's the hardware usage, if you think about it, somebody, Somebody creates a resource, somebody creates a framework, and they, they create this implicit policy. This is iTunes, yeah. right? There's an implicit policy. I can put my resource inside that framework, and everything's hardwired, right? If you think about it, there's no, no policy language or anything associated with iTunes, but there's a policy there on how you can use things, and it's hardwired in the infrastructure, right? So in this usage environment, these users are forced to use that according to that policy. Very difficult to you know, extend that or to differentiate. It's very difficult to differentiate between, you know, th these folks are pretty much forced to follow these rules. They can't, you know, I can't put rules into iTunes and say, I'm going to sell you this song and here's how you can reuse it further on. Yeah, I, I have to actually contact whoever owns the rights of that song and make that deal independently. And then we thought, all right, here's, here's a more flexible policy that you might uh, think about is that there's a policy language, right? So this person creates this environment, uh, they design this environment, and they're using a policy language to specify policies. This is what, um, you know, asset, where people are trying to just do um, access control of assets, right? I put my resource into that usage environment, and these policies have to be interpreted. You have to look at the roles that these users play along with maybe the security classification of this, and now you can use according to that. Right? Now, again, the problem with that environment is that after, typically after access is granted, there's no control over what happens after that. And so then the, the, the next one we thought about is, um, again, user creates the resource, but now it's the user itself. And this is kind of, this is, I think, an important aspect of it is the user is able to use some type of a policy language to, to bundle these two together. And we're picking XRML here just for the, the sake of it. Um, I, I think it would make more sense to do this with a more fundamental rights expression capability. Um, 
in order to now use this content, you can just push this thing inside to any type of an environment that has an XRML interpreter and it could be used. And, and what do you get out of this environment? It can be used, transferred into another XRML environment. Right? And so now you have that, that th this is something that was useful that came out of those types of things, is this ability to continue to use them, modify the license, and continue to use it. You know, the big problem here is I, I can't transfer that into a different environment. And so what people have come up with are these translation services. Coral, for example, is in a, uh, you know, where you take this, this, whoops, this thing here, yeah. right? Translate it in its entirety. OK, now it's going to work here. Yeah, but, but this, that's a tough, that's kind of, so, so our research is trying to address how you do this, maybe at a more fundamental without le level, without having to do this complete translation here. Um, so those are the models that we've come up with, with kind of usage, how to think about usage, and where different pieces of a usage and ma uh, management environment, you know, where, where different pieces might need to be implemented in order to do something with this. So that's, that's all I have. Um, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? I think we covered those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, is this, are we done? We're, well, we should we should, we should, get, back. We should get back because you're running late. So we have to get you to like 3 o'clock. I'm sorry. So we're a little oh. late because you're supposed to see Burton. And